Frank for more keywords. I'm Kyle Roof. I am the lead SEO for High Voltage SEO. We are a multinational, multi language SEO agency. We have offices in Phoenix, Berlin, and Melbourne. But we do local to national to international to ecom to everything in between. I'm the inventor of Page Optimizer Pro, which is an on page SEO tool. And I'm the co founder of Internet Marketing Gold, which is a place where we test Google's algorithm. We figure out what is and what isn't working. I'm most famous for Rhino Plastic Plano, though. Uh, Rhino Plastic Plano is a competition in SEO Signals Lab, which is a Facebook group. This was in 2018, and the competition was to rank for that term, rhinoplasty, which is a, a nose job, and Plano, which is a city just outside of Dallas. And the rules of the competition were uh, anyone in the group could enter. I think there were like 45,000 people in the group at that time. Uh, you had 30 days. It had to be a brand new domain, so you couldn't have done anything to the domain beforehand. And after that, you could pretty much do whatever you wanted. And uh, I have a strong team behind me at high voltage, and I felt we could do pretty good. And so I entered as well as uh, 27 other professionals. And at the end of the 30 days, uh, we took fifth. That's us right there at rhinoplastyplano.co at 97. You can see that um, with uh, 30 days, it was really pretty tricky. Not anybody's really lighting the world on fire. And only seven uh, people out of the 27 were even able to get a site to rank. But about two weeks after um, the competition ended, uh, our site, it went to uh, number seven organic on page one and, and number one in the maps. And people started to get pretty excited about that. And then about two weeks after that, we went to number one organic and we actually wiped out the maps. We were Rhinoplasty Plano. Uh, that's our knowledge graph. Uh, that reverted back to number one of the maps, but that stayed there for a while. And at this point, people really lost their minds. You might be thinking, well, good job, Kyle, you and your team <laughs> did a good job. But the reason that people lost their minds is because we did the entire site in Lorem Ipsum. And what we did is uh, we did the math for Rhinoplasty Plano, the, uh, how many times we need the exact keyword, its variations and its contextual terms on the page uh, and copied and pasted those into the lorem ipsum in very specific places. And uh, it really kind of went to show what how we view SEO is that um, while you do need to write good content, uh, you do need to get people to convert once they come to your site, ranking is a whole other thing. And, and Google's algorithm is just that. It's, it's an algorithm. And in order to rank well, you need to give the algorithm the math that it wants. And, and that's what this demonstrated. So things were going along great. Uh, and then uh, shortly thereafter, uh, Search Engine Journal decided to run this article. And in this, they said that um, I did this to uh, make fun of Google. And that, that couldn't be uh, farther from the truth. I did this to really to make fun of people to think that all you need to do is write good content. And that's what they tell people to do without really understanding how ranking works. And uh, they didn't contact me at all, but they did post my name and the site. And about six hours later, uh, Google de-indexed the site, which I, I guess is fair play. Um, but that night from about 1.15 a.m. to about 1.27 a.m., Google also de-indexed 20 of my test sites. And uh, those had nothing to do with the, with the competition site. They were um, sites that we used just to test Google's algorithm. Uh, they were all on different hostings. They don't really link together too much, uh, but Google went in and, and knocked them all out. And at the time, that was not fun. That was, a, that was a little frustrating, but it occurred to me that it actually pretty much validated everything that I was saying. If um, if I was speaking nonsense, if I got lucky, uh, they would have just rolled their eyes and move on, moved on. You know, they, they took down the, the main site, but then they also then went after me as punishment. And I think it's possible that I'm the first person in the history that's ever been attacked by Google just for doing good on page. Um, and so that was great. Just this past year, I did a course on white hat SEO because believe it or not, I, I am a, a white hat SEO and I needed to review the rules just to make sure that I had everything as I was uh, speaking on the guidelines and, and putting this course together. And uh, as I was going through it, I found this uh, rule. It says text that makes no sense to the reader, but which may contain search words. And I was like, I don't remember that rule. <laughs> where did where did that rule come from? So I put the URL to the guidelines into the Wayback Machine. And you can see here on either side of the competition, there are two dates where there is a shot. There's one in February and then one in July. And if you look in February, the rule is not there. But if you look in July, which is just a few days after my site was revealed to the public and people could see what had happened, that rule goes into play. So not only did they punish me, but Google changed the rules and then punished me for those new rules, um, which, was a bit, <laughs> which was a bit surprising. Then when you think about that rule, you know, if I write a page and uh, my users don't understand what I'm talking about, you know, that's going to hurt my conversion. Is, is it Google's job to help you to convert? And the answer has to be no, that isn't their job. So it isn't really the content on the page. It's that this shows how you can learn the algorithm. It 100% validates uh, how you can do SEO tests, how you can figure out how the algorithm works. And, um, and that's why they're trying to, uh, to 
to end it. So Google clearly cares about this. Uh, if they thought that was going to um, dissuade me from, from continuing to figure out how the algorithm works, it, it, it certainly hasn't. I now have a US patent on how to test if something is or is not a ranking factor within uh, Google's algorithm. And what we're going to talk about today, which is all, <laughs> don't worry, is completely within Google's guidelines, comes from the testing that I do. It comes from figuring out what is or is not a ranking factor, uh, which factors are stronger than the others, and, and how we can just do better SEO. So um, if it's all right with you, that's that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to try to get pages that can rank for more keywords. I want to do some basics. Uh, we will get into some advanced concepts, but I want to make sure that uh, even if you're at the very beginning of SEO, that you can get something out of this. Uh, and also, this will get us all on the same page. So we're talking about important terms and then where you can put them on your on your pages. And uh, I will apologize in advance. This next um, screen it, it has a lot of text on it, but I did that intentionally. So if you wanted to just take a screen capture, then you then you can have it. But there are three types of important terms for a web page. One is your primary keyword. You know what this is. It's the main target keyword. It has the most competition. Uh, also, usually the most search volume. You want it. Your competitors want it. Everybody. It's the main concept of the page. The next are the helpers, and these are important. These are your variations and your secondary keywords. Variations are, are, are can be conceived as very close synonyms. Lawyer for attorney. Uh, also, if you if you understand Google AdWords, phrase match probably falls into here, and we get these from Google. Uh, these are uh, the, often the bolded terms that are in search results. Um, it's important to understand that you're often not trying to rank for these terms. Uh, for example, if your keyword was best purple frisbee, uh, best might be one of them. You're not trying to rank for the word best, but uh, it's important to get that term on the page, and it's often how you get away from keyword stuffing. You don't want to throw your primary keyword on the page uh, a million times. Uh, your variations will often do a lot of that heavy lifting so that you can talk about the concept, the main concept, without um, stuffing the keyword in a million uh, amount of times on the page. Second carry, secondary keywords are often long tail variations of your primary. Uh, you might want to be ranking for these, or they're pretty close, uh, or they might add a little bit uh, of intent to the, to the keyword. You can often get these from related searches in Google Trends. And an, an important point on this too is people often ask, do I need a new page for all of my secondary keywords? And often you don't. Uh, if you optimize for your primary keyword properly, you will win your secondaries. And the most important ones are the ones you'd actually probably want to get into your subheadings, and we'll talk more about that later. The last thing are contextual terms. These give context and meaning. Uh, it, it helps Google understand exactly what you're talking about because you can talk about a certain concept, and depending on the on the con context, you could be saying different things. Uh, these are often labeled as LSI, and I know that old school SEOs hate that term, and they're correct. It, it's a very lazy term for what we're talking about, but it's kind of the term that industry has adopted, so I think they kind of need to get past that. But what we're really just talking about are, are terms that give context and meaning, and how to find these if you didn't want to use a tool would be if you were to take out your primary keyword, your variations, your secondary keywords, and all the stop words, and all those words that you're left with, the ones that ping the most across all of your competitors, those are probably your contextual terms. And so now that we know that those are the three types of terms we need to worry about. We also need to look at where we want to put them on the page. Not everywhere on the page uh, is equal. There are places that Google looks uh, on a web page for specific terms, and there are places that have are that are more important than others. So I've got them grouped for you here. This is not an exhaustive list, but the idea is that if you see if you're thinking of a term that isn't on this uh, um, uh, slide, you can probably figure out uh, which group it goes into. So group A, these are the most important. Uh, this is where you want to put your primary keyword. This would be in your meta title. This is often called your page title, uh, your H1 uh, body content, and your URL. If you were to get your primary keyword in those four places, the dirty secret of SEO is you've probably done 60% of SEO. Uh, do that, and you will rank better. Don't overthink it. A lot of people don't really want to outsmart themselves here. Get your primary spot in those places, and body content would be paragraph tags. Uh, one caveat is if you have a page that's got some age to it and it's ranking pretty well, don't change your URL. That, that, that turns into a brand new page. So this is for something if it's a very new page that isn't ranking very well yet or uh, any future pages that you create, then you want to make sure you're getting your keyword into your URL. Now, the next group, this is group B. Uh, these are very important, not quite as important, uh, but these are your H2s, H3s, H4. They carry a lot of weight. Anchor text, that's the clickable text on the page, not a backlink coming in, but the text you can click on the page is a strong signal. Group C. Uh, these are, uh, they still have some value, but it's obviously less. And um, some of these things are things that were spammed to death years ago. Uh, while you can't do that much anymore, uh, there is still a little bit of value there. Those are things like your bold and italic, uh, your image alt. That's the description of, of an image. Group D, and I, I put these separately because these are things that humans don't see. Uh, these are things that search engines see. And if you're using a modern CMS, uh, most of the th these things are taken care of for you. So if you're brand new to SEO, I wouldn't worry about these. If you're like, well, I think I'm intermediate. I want to move to advanced. I would put some time here because these are things you want to be able to understand what your competitors are doing 
and also then uh, what you can do and what Google is looking at. But these are things like your schema. Not all schema Google will care about, but there is some open graph. Open graph is the uh, uh, code that Facebook uses. Uh, so then when you put a link into a Facebook post, it, it sees how it sh that should be displayed within Facebook, but Google also crawls that. And then HTML tags, uh, the bones of, of your of your web page. Uh, there are different names and, and ways to call things, and Google will crawl that. That can have an impact. Uh, but uh, if you're like, where should I start? Group A, obviously, and then Group B, then Group C, and then Group D is how I would kind of prioritize things, uh, generally speaking, uh, uh, when I'm trying to think about uh, where you should invest your time and energy. Uh, if you're Again, if you're brand new to SEO, I would just worry about A and B and not really much else. And if you're trying to move into more advanced concepts, that's probably where D comes in. Okay. Let's move into some more advanced concepts now that we're kind of on the same page. And, and we're going to talk about semantically related pages. And what I mean by that is pages that have sections that are semantically related. If you can give Google a page uh, where the sections are properly tied together, you will rank for more keywords. So not just that primary keyword you were after, but many more. If you weren't aware of this, good, uh, healthy web pages rank for hundreds or thousands of keywords, and you want to encourage that. Uh, a page that is doing well will continue to gain keywords and then it's going to get more impressions and it's going to get more clicks and those more clicks should turn into uh, more conversions for you. But in the first place, we want to make sure that we're creating pages that can rank for more keywords. So what we do is we, we start with the subheadings. Remember, that's group B. And, and you might be, well, what happened to A? As I mentioned, group A is really for your primary keyword. And so when you're thinking about how I'm putting this page together, really focus on um, your primary keyword in group A. But now we need to think about group B, your subheadings. These are your H2s and H3s on the page. These are the sections of your page. As you break up a page, these are the things that are those little mini titles in between. That's what we're talking about here. If we can nail our subheadings, we can write pages that will rank for more keywords. All right, so starting with the format, you really want to think of your page as a Roman numeral outline. So if, if the Roman numeral one, that's the title of your page, that's your H1 your, and your primary keywords going in there, then your A is your first subheading in this Roman numeral outline. That's an H2. Then under that, you've got your paragraph text, your list, your tables. That's the stuff that goes underneath within that subheading. And then we would cycle back to an H2. You know, and that's then uh, another uh, subheading for you, another section. And then you would, again, have your paragraph text, your list, your tables. If you want to do H3s, perhaps there are uh, sections within after, after A, and then maybe you've got some mini sections. That's where you'd want to put your H3s. And again, they're creating little sections uh, on your page. So now let's talk about choosing our subheadings. What's what's going to go into those sections? And in this example, we're going to use our primary keyword as boat insurance. So boat insurance is going to go into that Roman numeral one. It's going to go into our H1. That's the title of our page. And what we're going to do is when we've got that boat insurance, we're going to do the search. We're going to scroll to the bottom and we're going to find our related searches. And, and here they are. So we have a boat insurance calculator, boat insurance quote, cheapest boat insurance, best boat insurance, uh, coverage requirements, et cetera. Those are the things that, that show up. Now what we're going to do from that list is we want to choose our lead subheading. This is the, the term that we like the most. And we can like it, like it the most for a few different reasons. It can be the one that has the most search volume. It can be the one that has the fewest number of competitors. It could also be just the one that takes the page in the direction that you want to go. It doesn't really matter, but it's the one that for you would be the lead, the one that you want to put first. And it's going to kind of kind of order the page uh, in terms of this is, this is how we're going to do this page for this particular primary keyword. Once we have that uh, chosen lead, we're going to do that search and we're going to scroll to the bottom and we're going to get its related searches. And now we have two lists of related searches. And what we're going to do is we're going to look for matches inside both of those lists. Let's do an example here. Let's say from that original list for boat insurance, I like boat insurance calculator and cheapest boat insurance. So I've looked at these this list and of those two, I like those two as potential leads, uh, the, the boat insurance calculator and the cheapest boat insurance. So now I kind of need to decide which one do I want to go to uh, go for with my as my lead uh, uh, H2 here. So doing the boat insurance calculator, I scroll to the bottom. Here are its matches or its related searches. And you can see we have three matches. Boat insurance quote, uh, what does boat insurance coverage? Because that's really close to what is boat insurance cover? And that's really close to coverage. And then requirements. I highlighted cost because I could see how you go from cost money to cheap. But I don't think in this situation that it is the same thing. Um, I, I think it, it's slightly different, but I would feel really comfortable that there are three matches here. If I did cheapest boat insurance, uh, there are two matches, boat insurance quote and best boat insurance. Notice that there aren't any calculator terms. So if you're trying to make the decision, which way do I need to go? And we really have to put a calculator on here, then this wouldn't be the one. Like if, if you have to have a calculator on the page, then this just wouldn't be the right term. And it's also important on that note to realize that there's no wrong choice here. It's not one is not more correct than the other. It's really what your needs are and what you need to do. 
But once you decide which is the lead, then you want to stay uh, with those subheadings that are closest to each other. And that's the way to create these pages that then are then semantically related. In this example, let's say we go with calculator as the lead. Uh, so we're going to say then our three sections are, are quote, requirements, and coverage. So you could do cheap if you wanted. I wouldn't. I would create that as a separate page if you need that term. If you want the cheapest, now then uh, you've got quote and best, but there are no calculator terms. And again, that'd be a factor that would come into what kind of page that you need. That you need. Let's, for this particular example, let's just say uh, we decide to go with calculator. So now we need to fill out our Roman numeral outline. So we've got boat insurance. That's our primary keyword. That's in our H1. And then we've got our A, B, and C. And you can see that those are the boat insurance calculator, which is our lead that we decided, the insurance quotes, and the requirements for insurance. Those are then the sections on our page. Now, we need, oh, and excuse me, and also boat insurance coverage. We need to then fill in those sections. Because remember, in the Roman numeral outline, we had the paragraph text, the list, the tables. Those are all in our ones. We can, get, we can also get that information from Google. We can go one step farther here and uh, simply do the related searches clicks for those terms. So if boat insurance calculator is my lead, and then we did boat insurance uh, quote for that section, I'm going to do that search, and I'm going to find things that I like. At this point, it's just what could I write about? What do I want to write about? And here I can write about cheapest boat insurance, best boat insurance, and custom boat insurance. And you might be saying, you know, cheapest was actually on the other list. That's okay. These aren't subheaders. These are now, this is now the text inside of there. These are the, the concepts that I want to cover in the, in the body content or in lists or in tables underneath that. So we're not creating new subheadings. This is the text. This is the meat of the page. And so these are the three uh, sections that I would, um, that I would, I would go with. We feel that's out a little bit more. So we've got our bow insurance calculator. Now in the uh, insurance quote sections, we have cheapest, best, uh, and custom. Uh, and that's all of our text. That's what I would fill in what we're going to put into those different areas. And we still have our other subheadings. Now you'd want to do the related search for each of those sections to pull out um, all of those things. So I won't bore you. So this is what it comes out to. So the Boat Insurance Calculator section, uh, you want to talk about the calculator, obviously. And I might briefly discuss, discuss the sections below. As we talked for in quotes, now we're in cheap, best, and custom. Requirements for insurance. So when you do that related search, it turns out that's all regional. Uh, it, it's location based. And I actually didn't know that before I did that search. So now that's, uh, you know, by state, by province or region, whatever you might be doing. And then uh, what does boat insurance cover? It turns out coverage questions is an actual term. And so is claims advice. So that's a great list. You know, like what are the coverage questions or something like that? Or, you know, what are the four things you need to do on claims advice? So th those are then fantastic things to, to put into each of those sections. Every one of those ones comes from a, a related search. None of that came off the top of my head. Uh, I didn't make it up. I simply let Google show me what it thought was related. And now that's what's going to go onto this page. And there's no magic here. It's simply pick a lead, match up the, the, uh, the related searches between your two lists, and then just follow Google. All of this can be done in less than 10 minutes. And now you can create an outline from a page that you can hand to your content writer uh, or however you produce your content um, and get this information filled out. And now you've got sections that are really on point and uh, that are semantically related in a way that Google's going to feel very good about crawling through this content and, and ranking your page for more and more keywords. One note, if you start doing this, is that you might notice that the related search has changed a little bit, and that's okay. Um, don't get lost in the weeds on that. If it's if it's around, if it's showing up and coming back, and you and you like it, use it. And if you don't, don't. Uh, I wouldn't get really trapped in that. I've seen some people get stuck there. Don't worry about it. Some it does change a little bit as you click around a little bit. Don't sweat that too much. You're, you'll be you're you're okay. We're in the ballpark, you know. That that way, you know, it, it, it's related and it's around, and, and you're going to be completely fine keeping it on your page. You're not going to harm anything. All right. So now let's move on to interlinking. Uh, we want to take advantage of these pages that we're doing. And we also want to boost them up. We want to raise them up. We want to then uh, have a site that can rank for more keywords as we're building out these pages that can rank for more keywords. And a virtual silo is a really good way to do this. Uh, interlinking is an odd thing where I think a lot of people either let it happen naturally or, or, or automatically through their CMS or they don't even bother with it. And um, it's a, it's a huge, hugely wasted opportunity because you can pass your own power or authority or relevancy or, or whatever you like for that term in terms of what links actually do, you can do that within your own site and you completely control your own site. It's the one thing you completely control in SEO is your own site and you should take advantage of, of the good things that your site is doing. You can also raise the trust. You can, you can boost yourself up. So you're not just passing things, but it, you can actually raise up the value of your site with your own site. And it's one other thing is that it's probably important to understand your site is probably weaker than you think. Now, there's an idea of your natural tier and SEO boost. Uh, 
I'm sure that you've seen this in action. You've launched a page and it just it hit page two immediately in Google and you're like, I'm an SEO god. And you really didn't do much to it. And then you do something for a term that you think is very similar and it doesn't crack the top 100 and you feel like you didn't know anything <laughs> about anything ever. Well, the difference between those two terms is one was probably in your natural tier and the other wasn't. So the one Google, it was in your tier, so Google immediately trusts you and is going to put you up in page one, page two, page three uh, within the first month with little to no effort. The other one to get up there is going to need an SEO boost. It's going to need to get outside of your natural tier. And, and you can do that. And, and there are a lot of difficult terms that that will happen that you need to do. Um, uh, boost would be uh, additional on page work. It'd be backlinks, obviously. Uh, any other signal that's outside of your site that um, you think Google is is favoring, that is a boost. The problem uh, with boost is that they go away. As soon as uh, Google decides it doesn't like that or a link goes away or there's link rot or something happens and Google just decides to remove that or there's an update, um, you didn't get penalized, but basically you just drop back down to where you belong in your natural tier. So it's imperative that as you're doing your SEO and the SEO things that you like to do, you must continue to raise your natural tier. And I think the best way to do that is to use a silo and use inter internal linking. Uh, to create an effective virtual silo. So a virtual silo is created by links within the body. This is not a URL structure. You can have a physical silo that is a parent-child relationship. Uh, and you see that a lot within, say, WordPress, for example. Uh, you can do that, and that's fine. But the idea is that the virtual silo, the connection is made by links within the body. Uh, and uh, it doesn't matter where these pages live on the site. So silo pages that we're creating for this virtual silo, they only live to serve one target page. That's all that they do. There's a lot of good reasons to have a lot of good pages that do the link to multiple target pages, link to multiple silo pages. That's fine. That's not what we're talking about. You want to be very specific that you're creating pages that only live to serve that target page. Those silo pages are going to have one link uh, at the top of their page to the target page, and they're going to have one to two other dedicated links uh, within um, uh, the body that link to dedicated silo pages. And that's all. That's all you want to do. Now, I'm not worried about many links. I'm not worried about sidebar links. I'm not worried about footer links. This, we're talking about links within the body. I want zero other links as a result because these are really only living to serve that target page. And then uh, from the target page to complete the silo, I'm going to link down into one silo post. So it will um, complete the circuit. This is a, uh, um, here's an example. And as mentioned, they can live anywhere on the site, but the arrows are links. So that's the target page. That's the page that I took the time to do all the semantically related sections on. And I know it's going to do really well. Now I'm going to support that with these silo pages that are going to have content that are kind of around that target page, but this is how they're going to link. One links to two, two links to one and three, three links to two. They all link to the target page, and there's one link going into um, the silo. Now, keep in mind, this is representative. It's only three little things. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to look exactly like this, and, and we can talk about this a little bit more, but um, this is the general idea. And uh, uh, this is what you want for an effective silo that's going to help that target page. Now, I, I've, I can already hear a lot of people saying, oh, I already silo my pages. And I say this in love. Uh, no, you don't. Uh, you might have a form of a silo. You might have something, but you don't have this specific setup um, because does your silo page only link to one target page? And you might say like, well, no, but. Or does your silo page only have one to do links to other silo pages and no other pages? And you might say like, well, no, but. And you must answer yes to both those questions. As I mentioned before, not every page on your site is going to be a silo page. There's great reasons to have uh, hub or resource pages or other posts on your site that link to a lot of different things. But I'm talking about pages that are specifically dedicated to your target page. You want those. And uh, this is the criteria to make sure that you're doing that correctly. So we now know the structure. So what terms do we need to get in there? And uh, this is a really cool concept. And this is what's going to help you create sites that will become update proof. You want to determine your natural tier. Remember, the natural tier is the term that Google will, you can write a page for it and really just putting it into the the, the, the title tag and, and your H1, it's going to rank pretty well, really without any other SEO, and it's going to do it probably within a month or two tops. Um, we need to determine that natural tier. So how strong is your site? How much authority does your, does your site have? Using a third-party metric here is not what we want to do. Um, we want to determine this by uh, either the traffic or impressions that our site is getting. The first way to learn this concept and the easiest way to learn this is through traffic. And so that's what we're going to talk through here. Um, you want to look over a three month span. You want to look for your low click day and your high click day. Take that average. Uh, basically, that, ra that range is your natural tier, but the average is a good number to look at. And then you can go after keywords that are within that tier. So here's a chart. This comes from Chris Carter uh, on Authority Builders. There's a fantastic article on this um, called um, 
uh, SEO with no resources. I strongly recommend you check it out. Uh, this chart comes from this, as I think Chris has really perfectly articulated this. I think this chart is a good place to start. Once you get into it, I think you will realize that you will need to modify it for how you are doing things a little bit, but um, this is just a fantastic way to look at it and just to get the ball rolling. So it is here is he's it's down by levels. And then you've got your your uh, daily clicks and then monthly is what he's got. But what that means is that when you figure out what your range is, so your with the amount of clicks Google will give you for a day, you can then look in the chart and then you can go after a keyword that has that monthly search volume is the concept. So wherever you might be, and you can take a screenshot of this. But again, you can also get it if you go to Authority Builders, uh, uh, SEO with no resources, and I strongly recommend you check that out. Here's how this kind of works. So let's say you decide you're in that 50 to 100 daily clicks. That's what your site is getting from Google right now. That means you can go after a keyword with a monthly volume of 50 to 100. That is then within your natural tier. You do want to keep boosts and brand searches in mind. Uh, if you're getting all brand searches, then your your um, uh, your tier might be lower. And then if you realize like we have a site that's completely built on boosts, uh, then your, your tier might be uh, a little too high. You need to come back down. You test this by posting content that is little to no competition. Uh, uh, and then you see how it performs. If you're in the top one quickly, and then really if you're in the top uh, in pages one through three within a month, that's in that's probably in your tier. Uh, if you don't hit that, then you're probably not in your tier, and you need to continue to move down until uh, you find a, uh, where your tier actually is. From there, you keep posting until you naturally move up. So you're creating these things that don't need any uh, hardcore SEO. They don't need backlinks or relatively little. And then the idea is that uh, you're naturally collecting clicks from Google. And as you post this content, you will then start to naturally rise up to the next level. And once you do that, then you can go after tier uh, keywords in a higher tier, keywords with more search volume. You want to keep posting and posting and posting and as you continue to move up and uh, uh, get more and more clicks from Google. Now, the really great thing here is continue to do the SEO that you're doing. And that SEO that you're doing is, is probably predicated on boosts. But as you do this, what happens is that anytime there's an update, Google changes anything, something happens, uh, your site becomes less volatile to all of those updates or all of those changes because a good chunk of your site is getting clicks naturally. It's getting clicks outside of an SEO boost. So if something changes, that boost changes, you're not as susceptible and, you, and uh, you'll be getting uh, continued sustainable growth. Uh, I get this asked all the time. And just to reiterate, do I need three silos? No, this just looks good on the screen. And that's why it's here. Um, a good strategy would be probably in groups of five to seven, um, build them out and continue to build them uh, until you move up to the next tier. Um, if you're ever in a position where you're like, what should I be doing today? I don't know. I'm really kind of spinning my wheels. More content. More content within, uh, within your correct tier is always the right answer and then properly interlink them to each other. This is a, a, a live example that I've got. So this is a site that I'm doing uh, on, a, on a course and you can, if you or in my course, you can see the site, but um, this is built almost with no backlinks. There are some citation links built just because it's an actual business. But otherwise, this is going from uh, zero uh, in um, October, which is a little cut off by my uh, picture there. Sorry about that. But it goes from absolute zero to all the way up, uh, no backlinks, just simply putting in content. So starting from a site from absolute scratch and uh, just doing it with content that would be in that zero to 10 space and then moving all their way up and going. Uh, and this was done in the CBD space. And the reason that I did that is because CBD is uh, one of the most difficult and one of the dirtiest. And so my thought is if I can do this without backlinks, it really proves the point. And, uh, and it does. This is all very doable and um, it, it's very successful. And I would, I would not abandon my SEO, uh, the things that you know work. This is something that I would add in addition to it because it's quite doable. All right. So let Google show you how to write semantically connected pages. These are pages that are going to rank for more keywords. These are your target pages. These are the ones that you really want to show up in Google for a lot of things. Do that. Um, uh, and as you're doing your SEO, you're going to create pages that are going to rank for more keywords. You also then want to designate pages specifically to support those pages. And those, um, those are your silo pages. And again, you're going to have a lot of other pages on your site, but you have pages that are specifically there to support your semantically related pages. What we're going to do though, is we're going to use those pages to raise our natural tier. We're going to post, we're going to figure out what our natural tier is. And then for those supporting pages, we're going to put in, uh, we're going to post pages to raise our natural tier. So we're going to post in our tier or a little bit below, and then we're going to gain clicks and steadily move the site up. And we're going to keep posting until we move up. You know, what, what should I do today? More content. <laughs> that, that, that should always be the mantra as you're putting out your three month sprint or your six month sprint or however you like to do it. 
this should be part of it so that you're consistently putting out content on the site that is within the tier. And then if you do the lessons in this webby, I promise you are going to rank for more keywords. Your, your page is going to rank more for keywords. Your site's going to rank for more keywords. You're going to, um, your site's going to be stronger. You're going to be less susceptible to updates. And uh, overall, your SEO is just going to be much, much better. Thanks so much.